Today's show is brought to you by Audible. Audible is offering our listeners a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. Just go to audibletrial.com slash beat and browse the unmatched selection of audio programs. Download a title free and start listening. It's that easy. Go to audibletrial.com slash B-E-A-T. Welcome, everybody. How's everybody doing? How's your, how's your entanglement going on today? What sort of entanglements did you get into this week? <laughs> Got a good entanglement lately? <laughs> What's up? Welcome, welcome back to Back to Classics, the Cinematic Movie Podcast. It takes you back to the iconic films of 20 years ago on the Big Three, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. I am your guy, your host with the most, Jay Alonzo. With me, of course, is... Danger Neff. David Danger Neff. How you doing, partner? Just, how's your, uh, uh, how's your uh, uh, what sort of entanglements did you get into this week? Oh man, I, I, I've engaged in plenty of, 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 of entanglements in the last, um, you know, it was one person, but you know, we've had several entanglements in the last week. Oh, but uh, it must be a hell of a journey. Yes, it is. I, I, I gotta <laughs> tell you, I gotta tell you. Uh, how was your week? I I've been at home, you know, for most of the week. I've been working at uh, I've been working at home. So it's mm. been pretty pleasant. Right on. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, this is the second episode we're doing this week. Uh, shout out to everybody who tuned in to watch us uh, love on Scary Movie a lot. Uh, but uh, yeah, second episode this week. Uh, it's the been final a- of these two episode weeks. We've been doing this for three weeks straight. Right? Yeah, yeah, 100%. But we still enjoy doing what we do, you know what I'm saying? But I think uh, this episode, I'm glad that we had a two episode week where it's just like comedies. We need, we just need something to laugh at this week. Right. Sure. But, uh, and, and, and amongst the things to laugh at, now we're going to do a lot of laughing today. This, this is going to be an episode that's going to be a lot of laughing, whether it's the movie that we're talking about, the news we're going to cover today, or just simple jokes being passed between oh, yeah. Dave and myself. So, um, what's uh, promos? What's up? Uh, what we got a new twenty for twenty coming out. Uh, new twenty for twenty. Uh, I will be battling tomorrow uh, against Sarita. Sarita Sampson, my cousin. You probably heard her name um, amongst various things uh, that we do over here at Beat. Uh, we are battling tomorrow. Uh, as 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 we're, as we're, as we're recording the show, we are battling tomorrow. Uh, we are doing uh, California against Georgia. So, as you know, I why didn't you guys get me for this one? <laughs> I, lived, <laughs> I lived in both states. <laughs> well, you know, you know, you know, be California, her being from Georgia, you know, we're able to, you know, hey, man, you know, I'm telling you, Dave, we're gonna do, we're gonna do a movie soundtrack, with me and you. Sad, sad. I literally lived in both California and Georgia, and no point was my input asked for in this. This is, this is, this is heartbreaking. I don't really know we'll, about we'll get you in there, man. If you, if you want to, hey, if you want to step in the threshold, you want to get this work. Come on, get this work. I'm ready to get this work. I've been all right. Let's do it. You know. So, but yeah, uh, 2020, uh, uh, CA to GA is what we're calling it. It will be out tomorrow. Facebook Live at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, go ahead, jump in on the Noise Podcast page on Facebook, and then uh, their event page right there. Just click going, and then on the day of show. We go live, jump on in there, have, have a good time with us. Uh, that's all I got. What you got? Uh, I don't really have anything for promo outside of what, uh, what you guys got. So let's move into movie news. And here's the thing. Uh, first and foremost, we are not a gossip show. But let's face it, uh, movie news has been it's news. very, 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 but it's very, news. very, very slow. Um, I, I, can even, uh, I can even say that it's almost been uh, non-existent. Yes. So yesterday. <laughs> well, 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 well to, to, to that point, um, uh, news has been very slow. Uh, even here in Vegas, we've now went back to phase one now. So uh, things are slowly shutting down again all over the country. Mm-hmm. So which, which we pretty much expected was going to happen. Right. So, all the bars, all the bars in uh, Vegas, including the ones in the casinos, are shut down currently. Are shut down, yes. Uh, it's likely to continue on with uh, with barber shops, and it's also likely to continue on with um, uh, with gyms. So that means I need to get in for a cut uh, before this all uh, before this all shuts down. 
might be something I do today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so enough about the virus. Let's get into something a little bit more juicier. So yesterday, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so yesterday, there was a, a rather fascinating conversation uh, addressing uh, rumors between uh, the Smiths, Jada Pinkett Smith and Will Smith at, uh, at Jada's famous Red Table Talk. And well, to, to give you a bit, bit more context, um, the singer August Alcina had met with uh, Angela Yee of The Breakfast Club a week before right. with a one-on-one -on -one exclusive. And Angela Yee brings up this whole uh, rumor that's been circling for some time that August Alcina had been uh, romantically involved with Jada Pinkett. And he didn't help the rumor by putting out a song just last year, literally saying exactly that. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> I love Hollywood drama. I really do, because this shit is so stupid. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a different kind of drama. So, it's, a, it's a drama that, if you think about it in a real-life situation, it'd be like having an ex- literally put out a whole ass poem on you and then somebody decides to question on him a year later because nobody talked about it last year i don't remember conversations at all happening about about this nobody cared so i don't know what suddenly sparked this fire uh we're bored at home dave right because we we're are bored at home we need something to do so she goes on the red table talk and uh, apparently four and a half years ago, which I want, I, I want to remind everybody of, uh, of Jada Pinkett, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith's age, which I know that seems, uh, which I know that seems weird, but she's a 48 year old woman. Mm -hmm. She's 48 years old. Will Smith is, four, is 51. They've been together for 25 years and there's always been rumors about them having an open relationship. Uh, with them being swingers or something like that. Yeah, yeah with them being swingers or that they're that they're kind of cool doing whatever. And when you start seeing the pictures, <laughs> when you start seeing the pictures of Alcino and J. If it gets back, you kind of start to speculate a little bit. So when she comes out straight out and says uh, uh, the following, uh, says that she and Alcino four and a half years ago, Alcino came in. Uh, wounded and hurt that he needed some healing done and her and will had hit a rough patch at this at, at this particular point and uh, she decided to get into an entanglement with Alcino literally using the words entanglement yes which quickly will shot shot down it was just like an entanglement like that's the word you're gonna use. Like, so like, gonna use that he's word. like, he's like, I need some clarification on Entanglement. Are you saying relationship? She's like, Yeah. So we got into a relationship together. And okay. So so fucking awkward. To, to to jump on that one. Uh, yes. Uh, for those who do know August Alcina, um, he he is an R, he is an R and B singer, uh, and he it has been well documented that he has come from a, a quite a troubled past. Um, he, um, his sister was gunned down. Um, I, I, I think he's from Tennessee or some shit. Uh, his sister was gunned down, uh, during a drive-by, I believe. Uh, he did adopt her, his, uh, his sister's kids. So, uh, it, so that, so that, that's definitely on record that he has mental issues that, that he deals with. He comes from a very troubled past <clears throat> and, and, and he has, and he's never, he's never, you know, not talking about that in his music and interviews, whatever the case may be. So that's not, so not, I, I can't say he didn't make that up. He comes to the Smiths, and mind you, he comes to the Smiths, not just to Jada. He comes to the Smiths. Yeah. He meets Jada, he meets Will, he meets Willow, he meets Jaden, he meets the mom, he meets the Smiths, right? And they take him in and they help him. They try, uh, uh, you know, they, 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 Find him help. During this finding help situation, Jada and Will are now on the rocks about whatever the case may be. To point to where even they said, and let's be fair, they did say that we were broken up. They were broken up. So there was no side. There were no side dude issues here. They were broken up, right? 
Jada turns to August, and this 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 could probably be out of the movie. The same person that you're helping, you know, you, you go to that person and, and you say, "Oh, I, my marriage on the rocks. We're falling apart. We may be uh, 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 breaking up pretty soon." Wham, 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 and then it's, it's, a, it's a pause. They look into each other's eyes. They kiss, and then an entanglement takes place. <laughs> so, so, so. There was a white movie based off of this. We called it Unfaithful. It's a f- <laughs> <laughs> There's a few movies. Yeah, 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 you're right. <laughs> One of the dudes wound up dead in the movie. That's all I'm saying. Somebody died in Unfaithful, though. I'm just saying. Oh. So, during this whole conversation, which was a 12-minute talk, There was some moments of positivity with this. Let me be fair. They talked about where they proceed to go from there. Now, there was very clear words that uh, that were said that uh, that, uh, August ended the relationship uh, with Jada. And uh, and, uh, apparently, Jada and Will decide to kind of work things out, right? Mm -hmm. Which is great. You know, beautiful. That That sounds great. But then it continued. In the last three minutes of this conversation, it got awkward. So for whatever reason, they, they kind of talked about, because one of the things that weren't really discussed was what was Will doing at this time, right? Like, was he just cool with this? Did he realize that nothing was going on? He decides to say, he decides to say, I don't want to go through this anymore, right? And that would, and that to me, like reflected a sign, like, like this is the last I'm going to be talking about this. I can't believe I'm fucking having this discussion with you four uh, and a half years later. Uh, know, again. This, is getting, yeah. a, this is getting a media cycle now, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, they talked a lot about about healing. I didn't really see healing. I saw a lot of frustration, and I saw a lot of. Uh, a lot of like uh, uh, anger that was uh, that was kind of bubbling at that point, and um, they decide to kind of end this. <laughs> they decide to kind of end this thing with the most awkward, awkward ending to this thing that you can now tell that this is just going to continue on, uh, not only to live as means, but I uh, probably going to get another whole media cycle as well, which is, which is they decide to go. Uh, they use the, the famous lines from uh, they use the famous lines from uh, bad uh, from bad boys. Uh, we ride together, we die together. Bad marriage for life. And fist pump. What? <laughs> <laughs> what? Why would you say that? Why would okay? You, why would you say bad marriage for life? Because I don't, I don't, he he ha ha, we, we're joking guys, yeah, we're laughing. But bro, you just, you, you opened up a whole can of new problems. Well, okay, so look, so granted that they've already had this conversation privately four and a half years ago, right? However, the fact that it's now public knowledge, and it, it, it has been public knowledge, like, like it, it was a rumor that has been going on about them for the longest time that they have uh, um, an, an open relationship. Now it's been confirmed that, okay, not, maybe, not, maybe not an open relationship, but somebody was fucking on somebody else, for sure. So now that it's coming out, it's, it's coming out now that, that that's exactly what happened, okay, so, so we, we're only looking at this as merely entertainment. However, you can, the, the 12 minutes there, right? You, you see Will, and you see the frustration on Will's face. Cause like, I, I think it's more so the fact that I have to relive this now four years later. When it's yeah, really, that, that, that's, that's definitely a part of it. Which that. ultimately, which, which ultimately I don't, I don't want to, you know, this is something I, I would really like to let go of. But furthermore, you watch them kind of go through this thing, and Jada 
it, I, I, I I knew Jada would would explain this in the most Jada way she possibly could get explain this. Using words like we got to an entanglement. Like and and I'm telling you, the internet is undefeated. Once they were done, entanglement was everywhere. It was like it was on shirts, like single, married, complicated entanglement. <laughs> Oh my god, internet does not I feel, for, uh, I feel for August a little bit because entangled side brothers have feelings too. <laughs> um no, of- listen, the, 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 only, the only thing I will blame August for is you spoke on this. This <clears throat> is really nobody's business but yours. So I want to kind of, right, and, and that's kind of where I want this conversation to lead into a little bit, because you and I have a little bit of differing, uh, differing uh, uh, opinions on this, and I'm going to give this to the power of social media uh, to, to decide what it is. Um, is there a person at fault? Uh, I don't believe there really is a person at fault, but I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you this there was a person that definitely got an advantage out of this, which was Jada, you know, um, she used, so for, for, for a few reasons, right. One, uh, yes, the marriage was on the rocks. You guys literally said the words, uh, broken up, but, but breaking up in a marriage and divorce are two wholly separate things. I can be separated from my spouse, but legally, I can't pursue another relationship technically uh, uh, to the point of marriage until I get out of my previous. Uh, that shit doesn't matter, right? And, doesn't matter. and well, it doesn't matter. You're right, but um, one of the things that I wanted to hit on was the person that uh, I, I kind of have to look at Jada's behavior here finds a side piece, right, which is what, what August really was, uh, and realizes that there was... Legally, le- legally, well, not legally, but technically, in, in the eyes of the law, of, of, you know, of a marriage, August was a side piece, yes. Right, so August was a side piece, and she utilized her power of using big words like healing and how we're going to basically help take care of this uh, uh, of this man because he did have a troubled past uh, to uh, to basically take him in and, and take him take it over. Decides to start a relationship with the marriage that's on the rocks. Everything is broken up. They didn't know if they were going to speak to each other again. Those were were those were words used on the red table talk. Two, uh, when she realized that uh when when august realized i held no more value to it that's when he broke things off because because that is what she's claiming she claimed that august was the one who broke things off which says to me two things one jada was cool with how things were going jada was cool with how things were going i got another dude on the side I'm going to enjoy myself with this uh, with this other dude on the side. <clears throat> my marriage is still my marriage. I get to still hold the power of being one of the most powerful black women uh, in Hollywood at the time, and decide to and decide to utilize that. And when the relationship was over, she went back to Will. All right, or something happened along the lines that they decided to reconcile their relationship. Let's face it more than likely she went back to Will. Um, she more also, than likely? She, hold on. What? That's where she's going. Hold on. Then when this whole thing came out, she decided to use her own platform. So there may have been more that might have been said uh, uh, off camera that, uh, that was going on between them before they agreed to whatever combined statement they were going to do, including – the bad marriage for life uh, thing, mm-hmm. which is why, which is why it's so uh, confusing for me. Why would Will go through this? Why would why would Will just not let the media cycle have its fun with it and and not let it be addressed whatsoever? I don't know. Um, I, I <clears throat> the, the best way to kind of look at it like 
it's to me, to me, it's it's it's. Oh my God, Los Los is a fucking fool, man. Sorry, folks. I, I, I'll check my Facebook, and uh, you know we're we're promoting the uh, twenty for twenty, and Los is posting a video <clears throat> uh, promoting the show, and the, and it literally says tomorrow get entangled with the noise podcast. <laughs> Yo, word of the year is entanglement. Period. This is but, good to be so played out, played out. But um, but uh, no um. You know, me, me and you have talked about this before. Just like me and Los have talked about it. And, you know, people in, in our core circle have talked about this quite often. You know, we're, we're, we're not super young guys. But we're also not really older guys. You know, we're in our 30s. So we, so we have experience. We've experienced things coming up, you know. So it, 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 and that would also include being a side piece to somebody. I've been a yeah. side piece to somebody for sure. I've been a side piece to somebody also. Now, when you look at it from the perspective of what you are dealing with, if you are, if you're going to accept exactly what you are doing, being someone side piece, right? <clears throat> that means that you've already said to the fact that the person that, that you are giving the pipe to or, or engaging in, 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 a, in, a, in a sexual relationship with somebody who is, who is married, you know what I'm saying? The smartest way that the smartest people are gonna look at this like, okay, this has a expiration date on it. I know I can't I can't pursue it the way I want to, but eventually this is gonna this is gonna come to an end. You know what I'm saying? Now you take August Alcina's situation, which is a hell of a lot different different from ours, because I view what he was doing that's like you getting a chance to like have an affair with, with 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 the baddest teacher in school, and then when 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 shit got hot, you told. You know what I mean? Right. But but more so the fact that you are in this industry to where you have access to a Will and Jada. Furthermore, you're able to sleep with Jada. You know what I'm saying? Right. Now going back to the pillow talking comment. The pillow talking comment is, is is something that always happens. So when you get involved with somebody, and and, and, and you guys kind of you know all over each other, whether it's in the moment or it is what it is, that's called pillow talking. All right, you can say anything you want to say when you're pillow talking with somebody. That don't mean it's gonna be that don't mean necessarily true. It just means that you you're, it's a victim of the moment. You're a victim of pillow talking. It's what's been said at that moment, right? But any logical person that's gonna look at this and say, wait a minute, okay, so. I'm this 24-year-old R&B singer. Okay, cool. Uh, she's a 40-something-year-old uh, talented black actress, one of, the, one, of the, one of the Hollywood elites, married to a Hollywood elite actor. Do you honestly believe she's going to leave him for me? No, definitely not. You know I, what I'm saying? So I'm glad that you brought up the age thing because – August at the time was 24. Two, no, no. Young he's, internet? He's, 20, he's 27 now. So he was 22, 23 years old. Mm -hmm. So it's one of those things that, that when I was a side piece, it was right around, it was right around that age also. And mm -hmm. there was a lot of, there's a lot of thinking that kind of goes on with that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, near the side piece, there, there, there's a, there's a, a, a rule that is kind of somewhat taught to men, but not really. Um, we're, ba we're basically, if she's looking for, if she's looking for a way out of a relationship, you could be, you, you could be that out basically. Basically it, it implying, implying that if she's already willing to fool around, then she's already on her way out. Right. That's, that's what the rule is. Um, so I think August kind of came, came into this, first of all, very young, uh, kind of came into this uh, with a lot, of, a lot of issues that had, uh, that had been going on. And the rule of the side piece for him was he, he kind of looked at this and he thought he was going to have his come up. He thought he would, I think he believed at the time that he thought, he thought this was going to turn into a good thing for him. You know, 
I'm young, I'm, I'm, I'm a good looking guy. And I got one of the most powerful women in, in, uh, in, in, you know, black culture, you know, that's basically treating me like I'm her man and treating me like I'm her man in public also, because we all see the photos. You don't hug someone like that. You know, you don't hug someone like that unless there's a little bit more going on. Right. Usually, usually I, 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 I could be wrong on that. Usually that the, the, it'd be one thing if it was one event, but this was multiple events that this was happening. Right. So my whole thing on my whole thing on it is I think August thought he was going to probably come out of this on top, like the way he thought it it was going to happen. That clearly, clearly didn't happen the way it was. And yeah, he's feeling a little bit jaded, I guess you could say, uh, with everything that uh, with everything that kind of went through, which is why he made the comments in the first place. Um. I kind of have to, uh, I kind of, again, and and this is where uh, Dom, who who is uh, uh, Lose's uh, girlfriend, made a comment about predatory behavior with this. And I kind of agree, in a sense, you know, that Jada pursued a bit of predatory behavior because she was literally having her cake and eating it too, you know. Uh, while while feeling like she she could have dessert on oh, the heels in her cake, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, having her cake and eating it too, while she also had you know the prime rib that she could always go back to in uh, in Will Smith. So, um, I think a lot of complicated look breakups are already are already weird and. Uh, marriages can obviously get complicated and I know people are going to be quick to kind of point out people's behavior with it but the, but the reality is is that when you're in a stage of pain and hurt um, and you're going through something like a like a divorce of a long-term relationship it's just collateral damage it's just collateral damage at this point it's it's whatever decides to happen kind of happens you know uh, and I know that may not seem I know that may not seem logical. I know that may not even seem rational, but it's very rare when breakups are rational. Most breakups are irrational uh, uh, when they go through. Um, the fact that they kind of stay together is is a, a, a kind of nice thing. I kind of have to I kind of have to question a little bit on Will on why he decided to stick around after all this. Um, but he obviously still saw value in all this. He obviously still saw something that made him want to continue uh, this forth, which... Well, and, well, well yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And, but, but also the fact that, that they both openly admitted at the time when this was going down, we weren't, we weren't dealing with each other. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, we, we took and, breaks. And that's, and that's fine. But there was something else that they, that, that they uh, said. Uh, he said, I'm going to get you back. She was like, oh, I think you already got me back. And I heard that. And I said, I said, you guys just opened up something new there. I said, so did Will decide to pursue something else with somebody else that we don't know out there or just have a whole string of flings or something like that, you know, and you were just kind of cool with it. So, again, everything is messy. And between them four, I can't say, I can't say this, this helped them at all. At all. As but this was I, I, I don't even think it's a good decision that they went through with this. I think uh above all else, I'll say this. Uh I feel like did it help them? Probably not. But then again, I don't think that that, that was that was their intention in the first place. I think it, it was it, it was the moment people it, it was big, big, big news. Let's jump ahead of it, let's speak on it. I'm gonna use this weird ass word. People are gonna make it memes. Like they knew what they were gonna do to garner the attention that, that they were gonna garner. Period. You know what I'm saying? And honestly, I mean, like for example, today, today, they're the it's it's, it's the conversation is in the news. August is already back in the news right now because he's he's not beefing with uh, Kiki Palmer because another. F- Ex fling he had back in the day, and and he was like, and she said, she said, I never dated him. 
So now he's going at her now. So like, okay, so are you just going after every single chick that you thought did you wrong? In the, put in a fucking song. You know what I mean? You're like, this is what you, you're art singer. Sing about it. Don't just go after everybody you dealt with in your past. I feel as if, even though it didn't help them, I think they're in the clear now. They don't really care about it anymore. Um, something that something that 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 they've discussed four years ago. You have to, now you're forcing me to, to discuss it again here today. I, it, it, they, don't, they don't care anymore. It, it's passing now. Now, let's say August comes 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 out comes out the shadows with like uh, Jada Pinkett sex tape. Okay, bro. Which is which is why, again, I don't. Which is why I question why all of this happened. Like, they could have let the media cycle have their fun with it. And the court of public opinion is always going to... The court of public opinion normally supports the negative thought more than supports the positive thought, right? Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, you know, you either A, address... uh, You you make a, a unified statement through a rep, you know, um, just stating that not a 12 minute video, you know, to promote your red table talk or whatever. Um, you, you go through, you go through that and then you, you basically drop it from there. You know, you, ba- you basically say, Hey, we, we said our statement. This is what happened. Uh, not willing to give out any exclusive interviews or anything like that. The conversations, uh, the conversation's over and, you know, move on. From there. Now people will hound them for that. But you have the right to kind of say what uh, what you want to say from it. The other problem is the unknown variable that comes out of this, and that is what happens from here. You know, is there more to this that could have possibly happened that could have potentially happen? I don't know. I don't. I, I don't really want to speculate on something like that. But uh, overall, uh, my final thought on this is uh, is I don't. I feel for the Smiths. I hope that this strengthens them more than uh, uh, disrupts them. Uh, I think it's best to kind of keep your relationship as private as possible. Um, even if you're dating a very a very public figure, just constant support, not really talk about your problems with people that don't need uh, that don't need to know about your problems. Uh, you know, and, and then that's that. You know, just kind of just kind of move forward from there. You know. I wish them nothing but the best. Um, um, when it comes to Will and Jada, especially Will and Jada, they're, 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 they're still looked at as elite, you know, goals, if you will. Maybe not so much today, <laughs> but they're still, they're still being viewed as goals, if you will. So I, I still wish them the best of luck. I, I hope uh, they can, they, you know, they find themselves um, uh, working through this and. Continue on have, having a, a successful and healthy and happy life. So, to laugh about some more stuff, <laughs> let's get to today's movie. Uh, we are taking it back to the year 2000, of course. Uh, <laughs> sort of, kind of late, but at the same time, it, what, what, what better time than never? Me, myself, and Irene. Original release date, June 23rd of 2000. Shares open the weekend with Chicken Run. Production budget is a uh, $51 million box office total of $149 million, currently at a 47% on Rotten Tomatoes. We That's watched it. Huh? That's about fair. You think so? Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I thought you would have said it, uh, it, it needed to be higher. Uh, it, it wouldn't be that much higher for me. Maybe 60. That's quite higher, Dave. It's a 12% difference. Well, okay, fine. I... Uh, the movie, when it comes to comedies uh, uh, of this caliber, don't get me wrong, there are pure moments of genius in, in this movie. Um, but there's also, uh, I, I just think there were better comedies that uh, that Jim Carrey kind of threw out there. I still laughed. I just think there are better comedies. Man, I can tell you right now. And, and th- this will probably be another controversial thing. Maybe not as controversial as entanglements, but I'll tell you this. When Jim Carrey is fighting himself, yeah, no, that that's pure. Comedy. That is is damn near it's damn near Oscar worthy because he is led to believe he, he, leads, he leads you to believe it's two different people you're watching fight. 
but it's played by the same guy. Like, there, there are parts in there where literally Hank and Charlie, you're literally watching two different people, but play by the same guy. Mm-hmm. I swear. And we're watching the movie today. I was like, oh my God, this is this is fucking genius. This is this is so funny. Like, like, yeah. We'll get to it. But but when 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 the fight between Charlie and Hank goes down, it's I mean, dude, I cried like it so much. We'll get there. Go ahead. You, you kick it off. We'll get there. Um <laughs> I, there's a lot, again, there is a lot to like about this movie. It's just, when I think of like, when I think of like the Fairley brothers, um, the Fairley brothers have done some pretty magnificent things uh, uh, between them. Uh, Obviously, Dumb and Dumber, which in my opinion is one of the best companies ever. Uh, Kingpin, which is a personal favorite of mine. Uh, There's something about Mary, you know, that, that's another, I mean, that's just one, two, three right there. Um, I think this is one of those movies that there's there there are really really good moments uh, uh, in it, but at the same time, um, I just I can't put it I, I can't put it in like his top three, or even uh, uh, and, and maybe even I, w- I don't know if I would even put it in Jim Carrey's top five of all comedic roles that he's ever done. But that doesn't mean that I don't that I don't immensely enjoy this movie. Uh, let's kick this movie off. Charlie Bailey Gates, who's played by Jim Carrey, is a, is a veteran Rhode Island state trooper who's been taken uh, who's been taken advantage of by those around. And it's pretty clear, Charlie is the nice guy. He he he's he's a he's a pretty okay he's a he's a pretty okay uh, cop, you know, uh, genuinely uh, genuinely pleasant ve- uh, fellow to be around, um, and uh, and. Uh, as he uh, kind of begins this relationship uh, with his wife, uh, Layla, who's played by Trailer Howard, the relationship is uh, very uh, kid at heart, is the best way I could kind of I could kind of say that. And what I mean by it is that it's very like, what if I was to be reassigned to the Arctic and the only thing that you only thing that you could eat is a uh, whale blubber? Will you still love me? Uh, will you still love me for uh, that time? And you know, Layla is all for it. Now, when I watched this movie the, the last week, um, there was something that that kind of threw me off uh, when when it leads to the actual, you know, the marriage happens, and then on the drive home, they get uh, they're basically driven home by uh, I, uh, oh god, what's his name? It's gonna Tony Cox. Thank you. I was gonna say Cox. I can't. I was going to say Gary for some odd reason. Uh, Tony Cox, yeah. Tony Cox. Um, when they kind of when they kind of started to talk about everything, it's just so unlikely Tony Cox's story. It's like it's like so you're just helping out, driving around a limo. You're also a dwarf. <laughs> you're also a dwarf. You're also the head of Menza. I really think people would know this very clearly, especially, especially you know, probably somebody. Look, if, if your if your future wife is the is the president of the chapter in in Providence for Menza, you would think that something would uh, would happen. But here's here's what really gets me more than anything. <laughs> they go through this whole little spiel of where it seems like Charlie was being racist. Charlie wasn't being racist. At all, <laughs> or or he wasn't being, or he wasn't being a, uh, uh, he wasn't being, a, he wasn't being an ist basically at all. He wasn't, he wasn't really trying to affect him personally. He was just saying, uh, "How do I pay? How do I pay you people?" Referring to the limo driver. So, how company do you work for? How do I pay y'all? How do I pay y'all? You know, and it's like there, there's this awkward, you know, little scenario that's like going on between it. And of course, Layla gets interested in Tony Cox, Sean Tang. And it's not that I don't find it believable. It's just it's so hilariously redundant that it, it's almost it's almost a little weird. Not only that, but 
of course, she gives birth to three beautiful black children. And it takes a while for that relationship to end. Like, because the kids are basically like six years old. Five and six, yeah. Right? So I'm like, I'm like mm. so this was like a seven-year relationship that they were having, basically a seven-year affair at this point. Mm. They were basically having to finally get the joke of of uh, of these guys, and it doesn't help that that of course the whitest uh, person in all this who is Fenrin, who's uh, Rob Moran, who's very well known in Fairly Movies, mm -hmm. um, comes out and he's just uh, and, and and he kind he he just kind of starts saying some racist stuff, and I I, I almost immediately like I'm like like he's like like how the water is just kind of. You know, it doesn't really absorb in their hair. It just kind of beads off of uh, off of them, and he goes, and "Shit, Charlie, those guys, uh, those kids' dicks are bigger than these sausages, and these are whole oh, ass whole big ass sausages. These are whole ass sausages." <laughs> it's like he goes, he goes, uh, Charlie, uh, do you realize your kids have a have a year round tan? <laughs> like, whoa, <laughs> come on, dude, come dude. on, bye. Do you expect any different from the Rhode Island State Police? No, not no. at all. No, not at all. Um, so, and remarkably, uh, remarkably, the kids are incredibly intelligent. Uh, from straight up, from straight up, uh, Charlie saying, uh, "Okay, kids, where are you guys building? Uh, uh, oh, we're building an airplane." And he's all like, "Okay," bah, 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 bah. drives off, comes back, a whole a full fucking plane has been built. <laughs> Bipedal airplanes been built. And they're taking off. Like, You're gonna take off that. Don't you take off that. So, so when when finally Layla uh, leaves with Shantae, abandoning the children, um, Charlie's in raised to is in raised uh, left to raise the triplets: Jamal, Lee Harvey, and Shantae Junior. Shantae Junior. And it's like. <laughs> Which, which immediately, you know that comment I made about Will Smith and being soft? Charlie is the softest of all men I've ever seen. Oh, but Charlie is the softest. It's the softest person that you could ever... You but, 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 but what makes it so funny is that when the kids are actually born, right, and the doctor hands the first baby to Charlie, he goes, it's a boy, oh, boy, 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 boy. <laughs> all right, so most interracial kids, right, the, these kids are dark skin, you know what I'm saying? No doubt about it. So, so the fact is, like, wait a minute. For you to have a white mama, you're you're you're, after, you're quite dark. You need to have a white, you have a white mom. One thing, uh, it, it is, it, it's so, it's really awkward. It, it, it's so awkward. But I will say this: Charlie is really loved by the kids. Like, yes. like, and 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 the kids really are great in this. Uh, 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 played by Anthony Anderson, Gerard Mixon, and Mongo Bradley. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of the town just kind of continually abuses him. But there's some really heartwarming moments that you can kind of see. It isn't, here's something that I really enjoy that the Fairley brothers did with this. They really show that the kids really love Charlie from straight up, you know, the kids are all watching TV and Gomer Pyle is on, you know, and Look, it gets it doesn't get any wider than a guy by the name of Gomer last name Pyle. Gomer Pyle. That's about as wide as it gets. That's Gomer Pyle. Can you believe that's Gomer Pyle's voice? So when they decided to switch it up to Richard Pryor, <laughs> and at first Charlie's like, "Oh God, no!" The language, you know, in his own, in his own head. But then he sees how much the kids are having fun with it. I love that. I love that. He's just like, you know what? I'm okay with this. Like. Like this like, is like he's like he's like you know what, this is this is something they can relate to. I want to have a good time with them, and then they and then a, a course moves forward with the kids genuinely being at least at least going into college at this point. Most of them are going into college, at, uh, or no, they're triplets, so they would all three of them would be going into college uh, at this point as they're finishing up their SATs and whatnot, and. Uh, they're pretty much genius level intellect at this point. Right. It's, it's, it's actually rather fascinating. Um, and 
all three of the kids, they just they just lovingly embrace him. It looks awkward on the couch because you're seeing all three of them and little old Charlie. He's like a, he's he's like a, a small guy. <laughs> you're he's a small guy, so he's like tucked in there. And it's like, that's one funny motherfucker talking about Chris Rock who's on TV. And uh, no, that's great. Yes. Um... When Charlie goes into town, though, and uh, Charlie goes into town and the first person he sees is uh, actually the first person he actually sees is is German Shepherd who's taking a big old shit on his lawn, right? And uh, and uh, he 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 says, and this is just an, a, 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 another thing that I I don't know I don't know what is there to protect with Rhode Island because the people are fucking awful in this movie, like almost everybody is awful in this movie except for Charlie and the kids. Mm-hmm. When, 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 uh, when he goes and they're like trying to, uh, he goes and he like tries to get on his bike, right? And and the dog's taking a big old shit, and he's all like, uh, he's like, hey, you uh, can you clean that up? And he's like, oh yeah, Charlie, I'll, I'll get to it. As the neighbors like staying out there in the yard, and he's by the way, have you seen my paper? He's like, yeah, the wife's got it in the shitter, right? The wife's got blatant it. disrespect, like, I like. Well, can he throw that back over when you guys are done? And the guy's like, can't you pick up one from the office? So like, and he's all like, yeah. Like, bro, I was ready to throw down. Like, right? (laughs) (laughs) Kids get one at work. I'm like, you take my paper that I pay a monthly on, and then I need to pick up a new one? And your dog is shitting on my lawn? (laughs) We have issues, brother. No, 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 no. You're my neighbor. You're my neighbor of all things. Come on, man. So wow. When Charlie goes into town, like the first thing he sees is uh, uh, first thing he sees is that he goes to the barbershop as he pulls around, and uh, he goes and he says, "Hey, uh, hey, uh, Rick, uh, I noticed that your cars are packed out, uh, parked out there." And he goes, "And we have a a four hour limit." And he goes and proceeds to like look at his watch, and he's like, "And your car's been out, parked out there for three days, <laughs> three days now, <laughs> three days now." And the dude straight up goes and throws the keys at him, and he, and he says, "Yeah, why don't you go ahead and park around?" And he goes, "Well, the law is the law." And he goes, uh, "He goes, why don't you go ahead and park it around, uh, park it around back, right?" And then the little girl telling him to fuck off when she's pretty much standing out in the middle of a parking. Uh, parking space. She's, she's, she's in the middle of the street, jump rope. Pretty much, she's in the middle of the street, you know. And she's all like, "My daddy says I don't have to listen to you because you're not a real man." You know? Joke. Yeah. And then finally, the breaking point uh, for Charlie was uh, the breaking point for Charlie was when he's in the grocery store and he sees and uh, he goes. He only has a couple of things in uh, under his arm, getting ready to go. And, uh, and the woman's like, hey, can I go ahead and cut in front of you? You know, you only, it looks like you only have a couple of things. And he's all like, oh, yeah, sure. She brings two whole ass full carts. carts. And that just sets them off. And proceeds to do the vagi, the vagisil joke. Now, okay, so, <laughs> with, with uh, so, so, so from here on, um, uh, I didn't even realize that, that a lot of Hank's mannerisms is, is mimicked of, uh, of uh, Clint Eastwood. Yeah, uh, Charlie switches personalities quite yes. literally as everything had been boiling up at this point, and he switches from Charlie to the personality of Hank. Which, by the way, real quick, that's not how schizophrenia works. <laughs> <laughs> Just get you curious. That's not how it actually works. Now that we have more information on this, this is very much a dissociative identity disorder, which is exactly what uh, James McAvoy portrays in the movie Split. Mm-hmm. It's exactly that. So this is a comedic take more on that than it is on schizophrenia uh, itself. So when Hank shows up, comedy gold just just begins to, to take. Go ahead and hit it. Absolutely. Um, so he, he, he takes the Vagiclean and he goes, he, he takes the, uh, the, the microphone and, and from the entire store, actual price check of Vagiclean. And then the, the chick is overly embarrassed. As he's walking away, 
no question. As he leaves the store, cuts to the same little girl outside. He's pretty much drowning her. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, please. And, and, and he goes, do you, do you still want to? Jump over, jump over in the street. I'm gonna see my dad. Wrong answer, fuck face. He drowns her, drowns her more. <laughs> I'm gonna tell my dad on you. Wrong answer, fuck face. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so he's walking by the same mom that the guys were like oogling earlier is breastfeeding her child. He stops to look back, cuts, cuts to the mom who's looking down at her. Hank is sucking the milk from the mom's tit. Keep, and then it cuts him again. He's driving uh, the guy's car that he threw the keys at him earlier with a milk mustache ready to go. Drives oh, okay. it right through the barbershop. I had, you know, I had to look this up because I, I had to know. Um, how real was that scene? Was, was, it, was it a fake titty or was it a fake? I was like, because it... Cause of course it, it was a fake titty. Guy. No. Is this it, a real titty? It's a real titty. It's real. It's real. They talk about it in the notes of this movie. That he was so that when Jim Carrey was filming that particular scene, he was so embarrassed and kept apologizing to the woman that he had to that he kept requesting to clear clear the set that nobody can be watching this while while this was going on. He was legitimately embarrassed of everything that was going on uh, going on there. So that's a real fucking titty. <laughs> yo, kudos, yo, kudos to Carrie, man. Cause like, at least he, he realized like this is this is fucking insane. But listen, sorry. Um, now, um, <laughs> so um, at this point now, believing that Charlie uh, needs a vacation, uh, commanding officer played by Robert Forrester, the great Robert Forrester. Uh, he, he just recently passed away, didn't he? Yeah, pretty recently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rest in to him. Uh, orders him to uh, escort Irene Waters, which is played by Renee Zellweger, uh, from Rhode Island um, to Messina, New York, because she uh, reportedly committed a hit and run. And she goes to this whole tirade like, I didn't do nothing like that. Um, I would have known if I hit somebody, yada, yada, yada. But they kind of figured he killed two birds with one stone by sending Irene back to New York and, and, and making Charlie take a very needed vacation. Have Charlie escort Irene to New York. Um, now along along this uh, along this ride, they come across a dead cow. Uh, well, Chris, a dying cow, if you will. <clears throat> and this scene is fucking insane because it's so it's so white cop of him. <laughs> it's very white cop of him. He gets out. He goes, "Okay, well, well, girl, on the green pass, pulls out his gun, shoots the shoots the cow. The cow's not dead." <laughs> Charlie puts like eight more bullets in his cow's head. Cow's still not kicking over to points where he's like, he's like plugging the cow's nose, like choking him out to like actually like kill the cow. Um, they make it to um, uh, in New York. Uh, Irene says that the, the accusation is a lie told by Dickie, who's played by Daniel Green. If you ever notice that, that a lot of these names in a, in a Family Brother movie, they come back around pretty often, like a Dickie or Bo Shane or uh, uh, Whitey. They, they they definitely recycle names uh, quite often. In fact, uh, fun fact, um, the fun fact that I'm not sure if you realize, but he does refer. He goes, uh, "Hey, thanks a lot, Seabass." You know? Yes, I caught that too. And by the way, played by the same professional hockey player, Cam Neely. So. This is all continuity at this point. There, yes. me, myself, and Irene, and Dumb and Dumber are in the same universe. That's all I'm saying. Absolutely, absolutely. So, um, uh, where was I? Yeah. So, so Dicky is a mob connected ex boyfriend to, um, to Irene to keep her from revealing his illegal activities to the authorities. Um, in Messina, Charlie uh, turns up Irene to uh, these two EPA agents, which is crazy because why is the EPA looking for me? Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, the EPA is very, very weird, uh very weird choice to to discern which uh which agency that is. But probably because the EPA, which again is just the Environment Protection Agency, mm -hmm. um these aren't guys that go out looking for for murderers or, or whatnot or or stuff like that. That's not usually their thing. So a little weird. And the the story of this is 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 pretty simplistic. Like some guys are looking to kill Irene. Charlie, uh, Charlie is just basically trying to trying to hide her away. They both 
almost act as fugitives. Uh, they both actually act as fugitives in this uh, for a good for a good while of this movie, obviously. Um, and uh, of course, at one particular point, um, Charlie goes and he's meeting up with Chris Cooper, who is, who is uh, playing Lieutenant Girk, and Girk is clearly the bad guy in this movie. And we kind of mm. see that because he actually kills one of the officers. Um, and you think, you kind of think that Agent Beauchamp, who is played by Richard Jenkins, isn't involved, but come later to find out, of course he's involved. He's a partner, right? Um, Hank comes out and basically knocks, uh, uh, and, and basically knocks out uh, Lieutenant Girk, which is which he then goes ahead and unjustly blames him for murder, and the FBI agents basically begin pursuing him and Irene, <clears throat> as do uh, uh, the crooked cops uh, that are in this, and it becomes a bit of a media spectacle, uh, alerting Charlie's sons to uh, to his predicament, and almost immediately, like they're suspicious of things uh, uh, at first because Anthony Anderson, who may become a, a that guy candidate in this movie is immediately like uh, if you knew that he was wanted why didn't you call in backup to go help out your boy you know to go help yourself out you know why did you go there alone and it's like uh, mm, kind of figured it out almost immediately uh right there he's a smart one um in this process, like Ch Charlie and Irene uh, uh, return uh, return to uh, Rhode Island, and they they develop a bond along the way. But Charlie has forgotten his medication, right? Mm -hmm. um, Charlie's forgotten his medication, and uh, and without his medication, Hank comes out at periodic times. For example, at one particular point, uh, they come up with they come up with the idea to. Uh, uh, you know, to escape, uh, to escape in this car, and when uh, and that Hank said that he was going in for supplies. When they go into the back to look at the supplies, there's like rope, sod, you know, sod, lawn dart, and and uh, fucking uh, and a fucking shovel that's like there, and uh, to make it seem like like Hank was going to kill off Irene, right? <laughs> uh, in the process, but of course they stole. Uh, the FBI's agent's car in the, uh, in the way and decided to ditch the car. And this kind of goes back and forth uh, between them. Like at, at one point, for whatever reason, Irene decides to look down at like Charlie's pants, you know, and you're seeing the outline of a dick <laughs> quickly growing. And it goes back up to the and he's like, to his knee, to his knee. <laughs> you're like what the fuck? Oh shit! I I, I love the fact because cause like with, with, like like it's it's Charlie when the camera pans down it's Charlie, camera pans back up it's Hank and he's smoking cigarettes. He's like, <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like the little things that that like Hank does. Like for example, they push the car off. Irene trips and slips, and Hank goes and catches her. His hands are like on his uh, on her breast, you know. Clearly, he's like, "Whoa, that you're gonna tumble off the of the edge of the cliff at that point," you know. Just little shit like that. Um, as his aggressive personality and overestimation of his own toughness, which is another hilarious fucking bit over this, because it makes so much sense with how uh, uh, with how the identity disorder happens. I think we can all agree that Charlie doesn't know how to fight, right? Mm -hmm. So Hank wouldn't naturally think that he knows how to fight. He just will use whatever whatever personality bits that he can do to, be, uh, to basically uh, to basically do this. So it's, in my opinion, hilarious <laughs> because he goes in at like one particular point, he sees a guy that like tosses out this butt, this cigarette butt. And so like, whoa. You can go pick up that button and he goes, all right, tough guy. We, let's dance. We go, we're, let's dance. And he goes and he does this really, really, really fucking awkward, like coming up and, you know, ducking over, punching a little bit, <laughs> doing one of these. Guy straight up comes out and like, and like, and like pulls a taser on him, electrocutes him, which of course turns him back to Charlie. And then they proceed to beat the living shit out of him where, 
where they basically like at least give a strained neck and he has a wheezing problem at this point. <laughs> Let's kick this guy's ass. <laughs> um and just and just you know little 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 things about that with this movie, which unfortunately it doesn't help the narrative of the story so much, but it's just like, okay, well, we're staying away, we're staying away, we're staying away until basically the culmination of this, which is at one particular point, they pick up uh, they pick up Whitey, who's played by Michael Bowen, and Whitey is as albino as it gets. His, he, he looked like he could be the child of uh, Colonel Sanders. I mean, it's bad. It's Whitey is bad. quite it's white. <laughs> I can say that right now. So at one particular point after insulting him and and the whole the whole reason why why Charlie even has this disorder is because he won't handle his own problems right because he doesn't realize that that you know she left him and abandoned uh, that that he was left and abandoned by his wife and that he never took the time to literally address his problems which it's kind of an underrated scene in such a comedy because it's like, it's a really like, like simple moment. When I was a kid, I didn't think much of the scene, but now like watching it as an adult, I'm like, yeah, like that's kind of what happens. You know, not saying, not saying that it would lead to a disorder per se, but you know, when you don't address your problems, it just bubbles up inside of you. Um, after they pick up Whitey, they stop in a motel um, where Whitey claims that he, uh, they actually killed his entire family. And Hank convinces Irene to basically have sex with him as an impersonation of Charlie. And when Charlie realizes what happens in the next morning, and what I mean, and I'm and I'm underselling that very much here, because when I say he figures it out, first of all, he wakes up in his tidy whities next to Irene, doesn't think anything of it, you know, doesn't even realize, walks to the bathroom, proceeds to try to take a piss, and his piss. <laughs> oh, stop. It's yeah, like, that's, that's, that's a great scene. Grabs, like the sign from above that he grabs a picture <laughs> of the <laughs> trying to like get this, get this all in to, to the toilet. And it's like, goes back and he's like, like, I really want to feel like we've been having sex all this time. You know, uh, why does it feel like we've been having sex all night? And of course, Hank pulled a fast one at one particular point, like finds a dildo. Right, and uh, he's like, "Oh, can handle one? Had to deal with two. And she was like, "Actually, that was for you." And like, he's just like, he feels so defeated at that point. <laughs> at one point, like, hugs her and says, "My ass is really sore." I love how they uh, they go back to that same world. The train to go. So I mean, I, I mean, what do I turn around? You sticking to my ass, literally. Actually, Charlie, you're stuck it in your own ass. <laughs> um, they are almost ambushed by both Shane and Girk, uh, but Charlie's sons, who who have also found them, have uh, stole a police helicopter, and in the process of stealing this police helicopter, sticks a whole ass chicken up this guy's ass. A whole chicken. A whole ass chicken up this guy's ass, and calling in a false report, saying that Charlie and Irene have been spotted in the woods nearby. Charlie and Irene leave Whitey at the motel and basically board a train back to Rhode Island, which of course, uh, which then Dickie boards the same train, having been ordered by his superiors to get his hands dirty, and he proceeds to kidnap Irene, and and Charlie gives chase, and it basically turns into this whole spiel of Charlie finally confronting his own problems with Hank, and proceeding to have uh, the greatest fight ever done by one solo person. Jay, take it off. Yes. What we get for at least six minutes is, in my opinion, if Jim Carrey was to get nominated for an Oscar for comedy, it would be for the scene. Because for six minutes, you see Charlie and Hank, by the way, are the same person. But it's is perceived and portrayed as if you're watching two people fight. Like when <laughs> when Hank has Charlie, Hank grabs Charlie's ears, pulls out his dick to like show a dick to the old ladies, 
it's the funniest thing ever in the world. Furthermore, as <laughs> as Charlie's like cut like he fight back, he shifts his body like like he got punched in the stomach and then throw his head back like he got punched in the face, goes through a window, and he goes, Is all you got? He goes, No, fuck face, spits in the air for the land back on him as if Hank just spit on Charlie. Oh my. And 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 then what, what what wraps it up so much like hilariously is the fact that Charlie oh I'm sorry, Hank throws Charlie out of a car. Right? Come back to that same car. You now see Hank running full speed because into that same car he just threw Charlie out of. And he and he and he, he thinks he's cruising, right? To look in the rear view mirror and be like, what the hell are you still doing here? You can't get rid of me, Hank. I'm part of you. And that scene is so goddamn funny because Jim Carrey physically can make it seem like it's two different people fighting right now. It's hilarious. Oh it's, my God. The best thing about this scene is that it's so convincing of from both sides that you're really seeing the softness of, of Charlie, but like him trying to stand up to Hank and Hank who's just a dick to to uh, to Charlie this entire time when they're finally like confronting each other uh, at one particular uh, uh, as the movie kind of culminates itself up uh, Dicky has taken has taken uh, Irene across the bridge which which this isn't really touched on but basically Charlie has a fear of swimming uh, mm-hmm. and they kind of mention it very early on in the movie and never really touch base on it until this time um, and at one point, uh, they go to try to try to make. Uh, they go, oh no, there's a bridge, there's water, and she's and, and Hank's just straight up like, yeah, that's too bad, tough shit. Come on, I'll go and buy you a beer. <laughs> yeah, she's screwed. Go, cool, I'll buy a beer. Um, Hank decides to balk when uh, D- when Dicky heads onto the bridge, but Charlie finally standing up for himself and saying that he doesn't need Hank any, it doesn't need Hank anymore. Uh, permanently nullifying Hank uh, uh, gets rid of Hank and jumps across and tries to disarm Dickie. And for some odd reason, because they were doing this a lot, a lot, and uh, they were doing this a lot in uh, in movies at the time, where basically the guy goes and puts his hand on the come on, man, you don't want to do this. But they always have a finger or a hand over the... On the... Like uh, uh, where where the bullet would release. So of course, Dicky does the only smart thing and pulls a fucking trigger. <laughs> it blows off Charlie's thumb in the, in the pro- Um, but then Dicky is hit by Londar, who's thrown by Whitey. A pretty good throw, in my opinion, which kills him. And Charlie and Irene fall off the bridge uh, into a river below. Uh, Charlie's sons arrive and basically rescue him. They regroup with Whitey, with Charlie apologizing for making him kill again. But Whitey straight up says, dude, you were, I made that up because you were sounding all fucking crazy about this, uh, about your backstory of, uh, for fear of Hank. The police arrive and, quick, and quickly learn uh, of, of Irene's, uh, Irene's plight. Girk and Boshin are both arrested. Charlie is congratulated for bringing them to justice. And Irene is obviously cleared uh, of any charges against her. As Irene begins to go ahead and leave uh, Rhode Island, she's pulled over by the cops, which she's sick of at this point, and begins to get searched uh, as this only proves to be a diversion as Charlie proposes marriage to her, uh, which she happily accepts. In a post credit scenes, everyone looks for Charlie's thumb in the river. Whitey finds it, but a fish immediately eats it. Uh, uh, in the process, which was very funny. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much me, myself, and Irene, man. Thank like you for watching our motherfucking movie. Thank you for watching our motherfucking movie. Um, yeah. Uh, let's get into some uh, takeaways. Who's going to hear that guy work? Uh, Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey as both Charlie and Hank. How about that? Um, because both characters are equally likable in very, 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 very different fashions. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
Charlie is is the nice guy, kind of the guy you kind of root for and hope he gets his backbone. Hank is a lot of the com uh, of the comic relief in this, uh, which which definitely helps. Uh, that's your court. There's only really one chick in this. Uh, really, there's three chicks. One of them needs to have her vagina clean. The other one has some nice ass titties to suck on. Uh, you also could have the little girl, but really, it's Irene. I. Uh, it's not Renee Zellweger's uh, strongest uh, performance, uh, but she's likable enough to to uh, to be enjoyable. Okay. And to uh, be fair, like like there was genuine chemistry between Carrie and Zellweger in this movie. It really yes. was. That's full of work. Uh, I'm gonna give it to Chris Cooper because this is a very very poorly conceived plan that when you take more than a minute to think about, uh, you kind of immediately figure out that he's that he's the bad guy. All right. Um, I cut that out. I don't... Some of the Charlie injuries things uh, are, are funny, but they're not... They're not overly funny. There's a there there are there are a couple of jokes. This is this is a joke I love, but I could all, also say they could cut that out. Which is Hank decides to fix Charlie's chin, and then when the reveal of the Charlie's chin is, it looks like it looks it, it looks like one of those old nineteen uh, like nineteen sixties chin to give like a stronger chin to white guys. And uh, and the funniest fucking joke in the movie in my eyes. Is uh, he's, is uh, one of the guys says, uh, <laughs> "Look, Daddy, you can now blow your nose in and wipe your ass at the same time now because oh, look, that Daddy got a goddamn butthole in the shit. There's a whole ass butt crack in there. Um, I wouldn't necessarily cut that out, but there, there's a couple of things that you can kind of shorten a little bit to kind of get the story uh, moving forward because the story really like moves to the side for this movie more than I would like it to." Uh, does it hold up? Yes, but not for much longer. I think I think uh, I think you can get a lot of kicks out of Jim Carrey in this movie, no doubt about it. But you can also kind of see that this is probably the point that you you lose a little bit of that uh, that uh, Jim Carrey luster. Let's and what I mean by that is this: is when Jim Carrey first started his you know comedic roles within Living Color and whatnot, uh, that rise to fame almost. When you start to get into like his actual filmography, when he's going through pretty much everything, you know, you have uh, Earth Girls Are Easy in 1989. Uh, then you get, you know, Ace Ventura, The Mask, Dumb and Dumber, which, and then Ace Ventura 2, and then Liar Liar, and then Liar Liar. Those to me are five really, really, really great comedies <clears throat> that make you laugh uh, all the time. Then you start getting to the other stuff. Uh, Truman Show was when he really wanted to kind of spawn away from, from being a very comedic to a very dramatic actor. He fucking kills it in Man on the Moon. Mm -hmm. uh, so then when he kind of goes back into this, I think it could kind of tell that Carrie was, you know, was, was kind of looking for the, those more, a little bit more dramatic roles because you would have this movie come out, How the Grinch Stole Christmas would come out, and then the majestic, which the majestic is a great, great fun movie uh, uh, to watch. Kind of goes back again to Bruce Almighty, you know. But then he does like internal, eternal sunshine of the spotless mind, and it's like that's a heavy movie to like watch. And that's and it. That's very heavy. yeah. And you're kind of seeing it progressively him moving towards the, those more dramatic roles because everybody knows how funny Jim Carrey is. Jim Carrey is still funny. You can you could you could watch performances even nowadays and find something incredibly likable about them. Mm -hmm. But um, this is uh, but this is one of those movies that like I would probably throw on something else with Jim Carrey. Dumb and Dumber holds up better than this movie does. I'll say that. And iconic scene. Um, the the final fight between uh, Carrie and Hank because. You're all, we're all leading up to this. We know that at some point, we all know that at some point, Charlie has to confront Hank in his own version. So to finally see it play out, you couldn't have asked for anything better. You know, it was funny. 
it was uh, as disruptive as it could possibly be, and you know, and just really continue. It continues forward. Um, okay. My guy, who's getting you that guy? Oh, hands down, it's going to Jim Carrey. Um, uh, for him to take on this dual role, um, when you're watching both the 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 soft spoken, excuse me, uh, the soft spoken side, and plus the uh, the full blown dick side of, of Jim Carrey, it, it, and the way they mesh together, it, I think it's great. Jim Carrey. Uh, who's getting you that chick award? Oh, Renee Zellweger. She's only chick in here that. Really matters. So the name is also in the title. Yeah. Um, but 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 to give her some kind of credit though, Irene, though well, I've seen Renee Zellweger in much, much stronger roles. Irene is someone who was quite complicated, but at the same time is a victim of, you know, shit kind of falling into her lap. That she, you know, she's trying to find the best way to to kind of get over these things. So uh that full award. That full award is going to go to uh, Whitey. Only because Whitey is he's, he's weird looking. You know what I'm saying? He's a weird looking kid. Uh, that's racist. Is that, that's not racist. <laughs> that's not racist at all. What are you talking about? Uh, cut that out. Cut that out. I'm with you. The, the, the booty hole chin thing is, though funny, the movie was basically getting ready to end anyway, right, so you kind of have the yeah, so you kind of have to like squeeze that last little joke in there, which you didn't, you didn't necessarily have to. Um, so while it is funny, I didn't need it. I uh, does it hold up? It does, especially the scene where when when Charlie and Hank are fighting. I laughed so hard today just watching the movie. Like this shit is so damn funny because he plays it as if. It's two different people. It looks like it's two different people fighting, even though you see one guy going at it. Now, I also agree with you on, on, on the thing where um, you can tell around this time, Jim Carrey is definitely looking to exit out of the comedic worlds and go more dramatic. <clears throat> exit out of the comedic worlds and go more dramatic. And, you know, it's, it's, it's cool because, you know, um, with the Eternal Sunshine, Truman Show, the Majestic, uh, Man on the Moon, which I think to this day I still feel like he was robbed of an Oscar nomination for Man on the Moon as well. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and then another and, and thing uh, to follow after that, even um, uh, I, I've caught a couple episodes of the show uh, Knowing on, on HBO, and that shit is insane too. So you can still find a good, genuine Jim Carrey comedic role out there, but you can tell the older he gets, he's looking, he's looking for something to be. Not, not necessarily go straight dramatic or straight uh, uh, comedic. Let's be somewhere in the middle. You know what I'm saying? So let me, so I'm, I'm going to showcase my chops while still giving you great comedy. Yeah, definitely. Um, especially when you hit on, you know what the problem with Man on the Moon is um, before I get to this final one? Mm-hmm. It's badly edited. There, 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 there is a, there, there's a there's a way to edit this movie where you would have felt so much better uh, about how this movie ended instead of culminating into into his death in itself. And um, uh, I'll, I'll explain it. I'll explain it on another episode. Um, maybe we'll wind up covering it as a super throwback, which I think would be a great idea. Um, but man, there's there's a lot to to really think about. Um, and finally, iconic scene. Iconic scene. Um, I can't say it's an iconic scene, but it's a scene that always sticks out to me whenever we even discuss me, myself, and Irene. And it's uh, it's not a it's not a trailer shot, nothing like that. Oh, it is trailer shot. So I take it back. Uh, it's when um, they're trying to convince the boy. Well, correction. When Bo Shane is trying to they're trying to convince the boys that their dad is, is a menace. Da 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 da. And as the answer goes, well, you don't know my dad. Like how we know our dad. He's a very sensitive person. And Millie cuts to Hank, motherfucking mama, motherfucking mama. That shit is so funny to me. Because they're really trying to like, they're really trying to like convince the cops that Jim Carrey's character is like, he's a sensitive dude, he's a man of people. Cut, but he's like rocking up to the most awkward song ever called Motherfuck Your Mama. It's the funniest shit to me. So, anyway. 
Let's go into some quick hits. Some quick hits. Uh, I got mine. I got mine. Um, ready to go. Okay, so we'll do uh, the glasses that Michael Bowman, who plays Whitey, wears are his real life glasses, including the little microscope at the end. Who the fuck is wearing that? Um, Jim Carrey ad libbed the moment when he asks his sons to kiss him before he leaves. One of them looks obviously surprised, which is amazing. Uh, the scene where Charlie throws himself out of the car was done in only one take. Yeah, I would imagine. Uh, Jim Carrey felt so humiliated in the breastfeeding scene with Sharon Weary that he had to empty the studio before each take. Although she did not mind, Jim apologized to her in between uh, every take anyway. Mm. Writers and directors Peter and Bobby Fairley have said that they came up with the title before they thought out the plot. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the scene where the boys were doing their classwork, one of them expresses his dismay at the fact that Pluto was classified as a planet. Sure enough, in 2006, scientists confirmed that Pluto is not actually a planet. Uh, Jim Carrey and Renee Zellweger started dating during the making of this movie. Mm-hmm. And let's see. I'll give one last one for myself. Uh, writer and director Peter Fairley was and is a huge uh, fan of the band Orpheus, whose 1968 hit single Can't Find the Time was covered by Hootie and the Blowfish for this movie soundtrack. According to an interview, which appeared in the Milford Daily News while in college, Fairley even dated an Orpheus member's ex-wife, who is the inspiration for Amy Smart's character in Outside Providence. All right. And uh, finally, we'll do uh, this movie was dedicated to the memory of movie critic Gene Sisko, who I believe died three months earlier or something like that. Yeah. It's a long time. Well, that's the show, everybody. Uh, I'm glad you guys are uh, rocking with us for two episodes a week. I don't know why we're doing this, but we're back to one episode next week. Uh, Dave, where can they find you? You can always find me on uh, social media. I'm just kidding. Uh, you can always find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Dave and Dave Neff. I'm the co host. Uh, here for Back to the Classics. Um, make sure you go ahead and follow our uh, movie talk group um, as well as our page, BTTC Podcast, a, uh, or Back to the Classics, a movie talk group. For some odd reason, this morning when I woke up, there was like five people requesting to join. Have you been promoting this, you know, to, to... – bro, I'm no. not – Like no. five people have straight up like come out and like wanted to join our movie talk group, and I'm like, okay, well – I don't know who's the one doing the promoting. <laughs> Come on in. Come on in. So um, thank you so much uh, uh, to those who, who decided to follow us on that. Uh, I'm turning this over to my guy, Jay Alonzo. Where can they find you? You can find me uh, laying on my couch asleep because I know y'all saw me yawning and shit. But um, follow me on the social media. It's be at I am Jay Alonzo. That's Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. Uh, don't forget uh, – Back to Classics podcast page on IG at BTTC Podcast. Of course, the Back to Classics podcast page on Facebook at BTTC, at BTTC Podcast. And of course, as Dave mentioned, the Back to Classics movie talk page also on Facebook. Don't forget, tomorrow, Sunday, July 12th, 2020 is back. I will be taking on my cousin, Sarita Sampson, in a California versus Georgia battle. Hip hop and RB primarily will be hip hop for the most part. And, uh, man, we got more stuff. Turn My Mic Up is coming back. We got an official date. I won't say it here, but look out for it uh, soon. But um, the, the, the whole original cast is coming back. Looking forward to it. Uh, look out for that announcement very, very soon. Besides that, man, uh, you, you guys stay safe. Stay healthy. Love each other. Love yourselves. This is Back to the Classics. I am Jay Alonso. With me, of course, he is. Thank you, See you all next week. Peace.